hey, I'm Lyle Hanna, and you've got the whole HRG crew and and the Morris and Morris folks too. Uh, we're delighted that you all uh, chosen to join us. Uh, we think this is going to last about an hour. If we get a ton of questions, it may go a little longer. But um, things are starting to break loose again. Gee whiz! Every time we think we have this thing in our pocket, it jumps out and starts multiplying. We decided we need to go back to the old picture of the people, all of them smiling there. Yeah, well, they're all wearing masks again, so we may have to change that back. But I hope not. I'd like to see us knuckle down and get this thing, get ahead of this thing. Uh, crisis management for COVID-19, phase 48, Sixth Circuit and OSHA taking action. Uh, let's flip on down the slide there. And uh, Jim is back. I know um, he, he did this, was it last week? Last week. Last I week. think it was, no, it was two weeks ago because <laughs> last week we were still trying to figure out what they were going to do. That's right. We took last week off. So, um, but uh, he's had Tyler help him put this together. And we, um, Allison is here and Autumn's here and Chase is on vacation. Thank goodness somebody's getting some vacation this week. That's great. Well, it's Thanksgiving. There's much to be thankful for. And your presence uh, gives us reason to celebrate. But we keep hoping we'll have better news all the time. So we got a lot to share with you. Let's get rolling, Jim, and just take it away. How are we doing in Kentucky? All right. So we got a couple of things we're going to talk about uh, first in this. That you're going to see my picture a couple of times. But we've got the Kentucky executive order and updates. I want to give you this information. If you heard that there's an executive order put in place, there was. Uh, it didn't have a whole lot of substance to it, but I didn't want to leave it out and have you all panic on it. So just a little uh, before I get to that, I wanted to share this with you. Um, this is May. May the 16th, it's as close as I could get. This is one that we pulled down. If you look, it's green, it's yellow. Um, there are a couple of reds, three reds, and then a few oranges, but we were doing really well. Uh, this is yesterday at 3.45 p.m. Actually, it was Saturday, I think, at 3.40. Actually, no, it's Friday. They are not updating it every day now. They're only updating it uh, when they decide to update it. I checked it to see if I needed to put a new picture up uh, right before we started. This is the last update. But you see the colors here. There's only two yellows, no greens, a lot of red, a lot of orange. So we're going backwards in, in terms of uh, incidence rates. Um, I do have questions, but I don't know who we could even ask about what they're calculating as their incident rate. But that's the status. So again, if you look at where we were, I don't know that you can doubt the fact that there's a change regardless of what they're doing here. But that's the status um, going from the, the uh, 15th of May, six months later to the 19th of November. And I say that because of, uh, let me get my highlighter on there, sorry. Uh, this this is actually the 19th, even though I pulled it on the 21st, uh, the 19th is the actual incidence rate. So what does that mean? A um, couple of things I want to put together. First of all, if you're in a red zone, this is the recommendations from our governor and from the state with regard to what you're supposed to do. If you go back again, almost uh, over half the state is in red. The other part is mainly in orange. This is fluctuating every day. I know Fayette was in red on Thursday, yellow on Friday. They're probably red again. They're right on the verge of being red. Um, the interesting thing is that Fayette County has, if you can, if you were able to see that, which is really hard, a larger number than some of the ones that are red. So I don't know why they figure that that's uh, 26.1 is not, but then, and I think it's, yeah, 26.1. Uh, over here, it should have been in red because it's 25 plus. And so I don't understand what the color scheme is. I don't understand what they're, why they're not changing it and updating it. But that's the status. It's a lot of red. Again, uh, vaccination efforts require masking in, public, in government buildings, encourage it in public indoor, encourage it in cra crowded outdoor, physical distance, outdoor space for gatherings. Uh, encourage medically vulnerable to avoid large crowds, so on and so forth. 
consider limiting in-person community gatherings. As we go into Thanksgiving, that's going to be a big issue. It's not a requirement. It is a recommendation, but that's where we are. The incidence rates and so on, I want to put over here so that you can see them. Um, the total tests were well over 10 million tested. That exceeds our whole population quite a bit. 6.24 is our current positivity rate. Uh, we were up near 10 a uh, week and a half ago. That's fluctuating as well. Total positive is uh, 770,000. Um, confirmed is 545. They've dropped the total number of uh, people who have gotten uh, better from it and so on. But that's your current status. So they came out with an executive order. I didn't put it on the screen. Uh, I read it to uh, Lyle earlier today. It was kind of an odd executive order, but he did issue one on the 17th. That executive order carries the number 2021-864. All that it did, they're required now by law to provide all of the information as to why there's an executive order. So the first whole page is there's a pandemic. A lot of people are dying. It's a really bad thing. It gives all of that information, which has been the same every time we've had one. And then it says, I now therefore declare, and it's two things. One, the pandemic is bad, COVID bad. That was the first paragraph. Number two, uh, adults above the age of 18 can get booster shots. Well, that's been declared by the CDC and the federal government, OSHA, and so on. So it was a little odd to have it as a full-blown executive order. Not sure why. I tried to research, is there like a lawsuit out there or anything else? The only thing I found was this on the right-hand side. So if you're wondering about booster shots, if and how and when you can get them, the kycovid.gov uh, KY website has this. It talks about booster shots, says who should get them, uh, 65 and over, Pfizer and Moderna, 18 and over who live in long-term settings, 18 and over who have underlying medical conditions, 18 and over who work or live in high-risk settings, and then if you receive a J&J, &J, 18 and over. Now, these are booster shot recommendations. It's really a little odd to me because it does not match what's in the executive order. This is 18 and over. This literally lists certain ones in certain areas where you should and, and can get it, um, but they're recommending it across the board. Down here is the key for anybody who is concerned about whether and when you should get it. Six months after a Pfizer and Moderna, two months after Johnson & Johnson, these on the right hand side are not coming from our governor. It's not in the executive order. These are coming from CDC recommendations. Uh, the FT or the uh, FDA came out with recommendations as to when you could get a booster, how soon you should get a booster. So it's six months, two months, and also if you follow your own doctor's advice. So that's the status of the vaccine boosters. So now for why everybody's here, I just want to cover the other part just in case you had a question about it because there was a little bit of blip on the executive order, but nobody did anything else after it. When we had our last discussion, I told you all hot off the presses, I think we met on the 6th uh, of November. Uh, actually, no, we met on the 8th of November, and I had told you that on the 6th there was a, a Fifth Circuit order that had been entered. Well, the first one was a very short shrift emergency, emergency order setting aside the effectiveness of the uh, emergency temporary standard. It did not declare that it was a nationwide. It literally just said that there were a lot of problems. Well, the Fifth Circuit came out with another order on the 12th in response to a request for further clarification. This is a sweeping order. This order, by sweeping, I mean it literally said you can't, uh, it told OSHA, you can't do these things, period. It didn't say in our Fifth Circuit. It didn't say in Texas. It didn't say in Louisiana. It said you can't. So what it said in the order itself should be uh, pretty enlightening. If you go back to February of last year when I told you all I did not believe that you could do a mask mandate, vaccine mandate under OSHA, it would be a substantial issue. It would take a long time to build, and I didn't believe that OSHA had the capability. 
Well, now the Fifth Circuit has agreed with that assessment. It says that the ETS, impose, and this is a direct quote, imposes a financial burden upon private employers by deputizing their participation in OSHA's regulatory scheme, exposes them to severe financial risk if they refuse or fail to comply, and threatens to decimate their workforces and business prospects by forcing unwilling employees to take their shots, take their tests, or hit the road. That's a quote from the Fifth Circuit. Um, OSHA was not intended to allow sweeping pronouncements on public health, direct quote, not me, and that it also criticized the ETS for not making an attempt to quote, account for differences in workplaces and in workers that have more than a little bearing on workers' varying degrees of susceptibility to the supposedly grave danger the ETS purports to address. In other words, you can't treat a mine worker the same as an office worker. Um, and this comes in because, as I told you before, asbestos and black lung disease were the only two other times that they used the ETS. They didn't treat black lung di disease requirements the same for an office worker versus somebody going into a coal mine. They didn't treat it the same for asbestos, for somebody working in an asbestos-laden environment versus somebody who is simply in an office setting where asbestos might be in a ceiling tile. Completely different, you have to treat it differently, and you can't have a rubber stamp across the board, unilateral ETS for everybody, even though they're in different settings. So that's the Fifth Circuit. It then questioned whether the OSHA has shown a grave danger and whether the ETS is even necessary. Again, those are all things that we raised for the last eight months, 10 months, uh, 10 months trying to get you all prepared. But it was silent as to whether it applied to the Fifth Circuit or nationwide. Then it says, however, at the end, OSHA requires OSHA to, quote, take no steps to implement or enforce the ETS until further court order. And it did not include any geographic limitation on that restriction. So where does that leave us? Where are we and what do we do? Well, 11 of the 12 United, 12 United States Circuit Courts, and that should be 13, sorry, uh, 11 of the 13, because there's a federal court as well, um, had appeals pending before them challenging the ETS. So when there are that many reviews of a federal action that are filed in multiple jurisdictions, uh, our great and wonderful, and this is kind of great and wonderful, but it's kind of funny the way it happens, our great and wonderful federal judicial system has a really super special, really super ingenious way to figure out how do we handle this in the most efficient way possible. We'll draw lottery balls. So they literally put all of the jur jurisdictions into a hopper, they crank the hopper and they pull out a ball and it has a number on it. It's like bingo. It's like the lottery and who wins and who loses. Well, I told you all before, we're in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. That's Kentucky, Ohio, Michigan, and Tennessee. Um, we had a case pending. It was brought by Ohio and Tennessee, not Michigan, Kentucky as well. I'm sorry, Ohio, Tennessee, and Kentucky, Kansas, uh, Missouri, um, a couple of other states joined in our petition to challenge the ETS, um, and lo and behold, we won the lottery. Now, what does that mean for everybody? On the 16th of November, they drew the ball, said six. It means the Sixth Circuit gets the, the assignment. Now, what I'm about to say is not political, it is just a matter of fact. There are certain jurisdictions, you've heard me talk about the Ninth Circuit, uh, very, very extremely liberal with a lot of appointments that are on the left side. There are other circuits that are extraordinarily conservative. The fifth, where this came out of, is almost guaranteed to have a conservative ruling because of the number of judges that came from a conservative appointment. Well, the Sixth Circuit is a little bit the same. So it sits in Cincinnati, Ohio, that has absolutely nothing to do with anything other than if you want to go watch it, it's not very far away. 16 full-time judges, 11 were appointed by Republican presidents. That means there are only five that have ever been appointed by a Democrat president. 
I've been in front of a lot of these judges before on panels. Most of the judges in this country do what they deem is appropriate. It does not matter who appointed them. However, they come from an idealistic standpoint where if you are supporting a Democratic president and you get appointed by that Democratic president, you believe more in governmental control. It's just a fact. If you are appointed by the Republican, chances are you believe in very little or less government control. There are exceptions even on the Supreme Court to judges who were appointed by a Republican who ended up being uh, liberal and vice versa. However, this tends to lean toward an employer based ruling. Why? Because the chances are the randomly selected three judge panel will be possibly at least two Republican selected uh, panelists. The other thing is that the court could determine an en banc, which means all 16 full-time judges hear the case at one time. Those are rare. But this would be the time to do it when there are literally cases pending across the entire country. They're all going to be heard by one set of judges. We checked this morning. The Sixth Circuit has not yet issued any guidance on how they plan on using this, which three judges have been assigned. What will happen is it will first be assigned to three. Someone will petition for an en banc, whoever doesn't like the panel, basically. So if it's a Democrat-laden panel, all three are, are from Democrat-appointed uh, presidents, chances are the, the other side will go, well, we want a full en banc. But vice versa, if all three are Republican-appointed, you're going to get the other side saying we want an en banc. It is entirely in the discretion of the majority of the Sixth Circuit as to whether an en banc will be granted. Again, en banc meaning entire panel. Once they have this case, they will probably expedite the determination on this issue because of the national impact, the emergency impact, and so on. What we don't know is, are they going to uphold the Fifth Circuit immediately? Are they going to have new briefing on it? Will they issue their own opinion? Will they tailor the Fifth Circuit, meaning reduce it down, explain it more? None of that is known within the next few days, literally probably Wednesday or Thursday of this week, the Sixth Circuit will probably issue some chief judge rulings saying this is how we're going to handle it, this is who the panel is that's been assigned, and this is how we're going to handle the currently pending order that set aside the EEOC. What does that mean for you? Since there is no timetable right now, we needed to find out what is OSHA going to do? How soon will they kick in and threaten people with any kind of action? Well, that's where this, that's why we're here. So OSHA published this on the 16th, Thursday afternoon after the Fifth Circuit uh, ruling on the 12th and after the Sixth Circuit was assigned. Now, you, I, I tend to be one that thinks that things happen for reasons. I truly believe that the um, OSHA and the current administration were waiting to see if there was a chance that the Ninth Circuit got this, or the First Circuit, or the Third Circuit. Why? Because if one of those circuits had received this, chances are the Fifth Circuit order would have been set aside immediately. Uh, OSHA would have been re-implemented immediately and there wouldn't have been an emergency uh, order setting it aside. They seemed to wait until the Sixth Circuit was assigned, and if you look at the Sixth Circuit being with the 11 out of 16 judges, chances are the Fifth Circuit's not going to be just thrown out completely while this case is pending. Now, I'm going to read this, then I want to tell you what, the, what all of this means. Um, so, this is literally a direct quote from OSHA. On November 12th, the Fifth Circuit granted a motion to stay OSHA's COVID-19 vaccination testing emergency temporary standard published on November the 5th. The court ordered that OSHA take no steps to implement or enforce the ETS until further court order. While OSHA remains confident in its authority to protect workers in, emergency, in emergencies, OSHA has suspended activities related to the implementation and enforcement of the ETS pending further development in the litigation. So, 
First thing I want to tell you is this. The Fifth Circuit order was a temporary interim order. It is not the final say. It literally said, stop, put the brakes on while we issue rulings in this case. The Sixth Circuit, if they come out with an order, will be the same exact thing, or it could set it aside, or it could do anything else it wants to do because this case now pins in the Sixth Circuit. These are temporary reliefs. They are not final until the Sixth Circuit issues its final ruling. And let's all be very blunt and honest here. We all know this is not going to stop at the Sixth Circuit. The United States Supreme Court will have to weigh in before any of this gets resolved. So we're going to be in this muddy time period for a little time. So what does this mean? The ETS is still uncertain. The concern here is this statement, while OSHA remains confident in its authority to protect workers in emergencies, OSHA has suspended activities related to the implementation and enforcement. If you go to their website, it, the ETS is still there. They still are encouraging. They're still suggesting. They simply are no longer going to penalize and fine workers, I'm sorry, employers for violation of their policies. So this is still there's still an intent to go forward that you need to be aware of and you need to really monitor. The good news for us is being in the Sixth Circuit, whatever comes out will most definitely impact Kentucky because this is our circuit. So other circuits could determine, well, they didn't really address these issues or maybe this doesn't apply to California or wherever. We're in Kentucky. Kentucky is the Sixth Circuit, so whatever comes out of this, it's going to be binding on you. But you're going to need to watch it carefully because when they issue whatever temporary orders they do, it will take immediate effect and it will impact the enforcement of this Fifth Circuit. Then OSHA, let's say that they set it aside, hypothetical, not saying one way or the other. If they set this aside, immediately OSHA could then flip because it is an emergency temporary standard. It could be enforceable tomorrow. Literally, the day that the order is entered, lifting the stay, it could be enforceable immediately. So you have to keep track of that. You have to stay on task. And I'm going to walk through the recommendations at the end of this. So it's reasonable to assume Sixth Circuit will issue a decision. Uh, we don't know when, but it'll say, yes, Fifth Circuit, stay in place. No, it doesn't. Or, hey, we like our own language better. We'll have to wait to see. Um, it is, like I said, the, the OSHA website with this ominous threat there of we still believe in what we're doing and we're very confident, but we're just going to stay back for a little bit, scares me because that means, again, they could just flip that switch and you're going to be into a big issue. So shortly after they suspended it, several larger companies uh, to undertook efforts. I didn't list them here, but if you go look at like Walt Disney World and some of the bigger they literally suspended it. There have been some other interesting developments we're going to talk about on the state page here in a second. Um, you know, the, the, I don't know why this is on here twice. That's my fault. I typed it in there. Um, actually, I meant to delete this slide because I thought the other one had it on there. So we're just going to keep going. Uh, this area down here, though, are the two things that I didn't get to fit on the other page that I wanted on here. So um, the Safer Federal Workplace Task Force. This is if you have a, if a contract with the federal government, we had several people asking those questions during the last um, webinar. They pushed back compliance date to January the 18th. Not coincidentally, that is also the January 4th fully vaccinated uh, date that was in the original ETS because, whoops, sorry, in order to comply with this new federal contractor compliance date, you have to back off two weeks before. So that's January 4th. So if you are a uh, federal contractor, you still have a compliance requirement, but that compliance requirement was pushed back to January the 18th. Federal workers, anyone that you know or anybody on here, I don't know how many we pull from the federal government. Your compliance date is today. Last numbers I saw were at least 10% of the federal employee population is not vaccinated, they're fired as of today uh, or laid off or whatever term you want to use. They were mandated to comply by today to be fully compliant or they were laid off. 
So we just lost 10% of the federal government workforce. Uh, on the short term, it means less money spent. On the long term, it means fewer services. Mm -hmm. So UP, uh, Postal Service, right before uh, Christmas, uh, anyone that's in the prison systems, anyone like uh, guards, workers, it, it's going to impact because at least 10% of the people are not vaccinated and they are in fact gone as of today. So this, the reason why I put that in there, the ETS suspension from the Fifth Circuit has zero impact on the federal. It has zero impact, I didn't list this separately, but it has zero impact on your hospitals. You fall under a different ETS or a different, uh, not ETS, OSHA standard for hospitals. You still must be compliant with those. And the federal workers, your date is today. So don't, uh, Tim just jumped the gun on the state OSHA program. Uh, hold on, because it's this page right now. So the question is, update on state and local laws. And you remember I told you that the ETS said we control. In all states, you must control, and we're going to take over. Well, guess what? There's a little rebellion going on among the states. Kentucky is one of those. It has not yet implemented it, but Florida is leading the way on this. So Florida signed a law. So did Tennessee, West Virginia, Alabama, Arkansas, Iowa, Montana, Texas, and Illinois. Illinois is the outlier here. But the Florida's is the most interesting from a legal perspective because Florida signed into law measures that would prohibit vaccine mandates for public and private employers. It also re-triggered because they had one but it's changing it. The FOSHA, Florida OSHA, Kentucky has COSHA, Tennessee has TOSHA, I'm not sure about the rest of them but I've dealt with all of those, Florida, Tennessee, Kentucky, they have their own state OSHAs. Well, Florida has literally said, you know what? We hereby no longer follow federal OSHA. We don't care, we don't need them, and we're not gonna follow. This is gonna be a trend across the country because OSHA has overstepped with this law, like I told you back to last February, if they overstep too far, state legislative bodies are gonna come in and say, no, we can protect our own and we're going to adopt our own OSHA and we don't care about the federal. So that's what's happened. So on, on the 18th, Florida literally signed into laws, into law, a prohibition against mask mandates, including those companies over 100 employees. Uh, what that does is now there is a full blown battle between federal OSHA and state FOSHA. And the state FOSHA put in the penalties to basically match the federal. So if you do it under federal, it was like $40,000 or something like that, 14 per. Well, FOSHA came out and said we're gonna go with $50,000 per violation for enforcing a mask mandate. So you immediately had certain uh, hospitals who brought people back. There are pending lawsuits and we're not sure what that's gonna do. The reason why I'm talking about Florida is Florida has a pretty conservative um, uh, legislature. Kentucky has an extraordinarily conservative legislature. Um, and so if Kentucky gets reconvened or January of next year when it does normally reconvene, I look for a brand new COSHA that will set aside the entire uh, enforcement capability of OSHA. That's when we're going to have to have some serious talks with all of you because trying to balance between federal and state is going to get to be a nightmare. The bizarre part of this is and Lyle, you remember that we, uh, for a little bit, we started talking about new areas of, because we thought we were almost done with COVID. So one of the first things I suggested was um, uh, drug enforcement. You remember we had the, the marijuana laws and we talked about it a little bit. If you wanna know where all of these laws are coming from, it comes from the marijuana laws because the federal government has declared marijuana bad. 
states have said marijuana okay and you have this battle right now between state rights and federal rights well now states are saying and this also came out of uh, the sanctuary cities for immigrants and so on where there were certain liberal states that um, like san francisco declared we're a sanctuary city we're not going to follow federal law we're not going to turn over anybody who violated whatever well now the states are going well wait a minute if the federal government allowed sanctuary cities if the federal government allowed drug use if the federal government is allowing states to make money off of, of taxes on marijuana why can't we implement and reject osha reject federal oversight and we're going to build our own so this whole thing is coming out of the sanctuary city the marijuana laws that have taken over several of the states that we talked about earlier this year. So these are the states right here that have implemented it with the exception of Illinois. The interesting thing in Illinois is Illinois already had a law that said that they couldn't do it. Illinois, because they're rather liberal, said, well, we're going to throw out the conscious, object conscience objector law and we're going to insist that COVID is an exception to it. So they called a special session. Yes, they got it through the session, but they couldn't do it on an emergency basis. So under their law, laws don't become effective for, I believe it's nine months. So here they are with a law that says COVID-19 will not be an exception or will be an exception to a law that said that people didn't have to be vaccinated and didn't have to do certain things in employment. But it doesn't become law until June of 2022. So right now, whether they like it or not, they've got an exception to the federal mandate in Illinois because they already built the law. So with Kentucky's legislature, the reason why I told you all of this is I truly believe that this will be our stance for all employers, regardless of size. Why do I believe that? Well, it's not just because I can predict the future. It's because Kentucky already has one. If you remember back in March, I told you about Senate Bill 8. Uh, it became law. It was adopted over the governor's objection, veto, then the supermajority overrode his veto. So it provides exceptions from the mandatory immunization of any child, emancipated minor, or adult who personally or by a parent submits a written sworn statement objecting to the immunization based on consciously held consciously uh, conscience uh, conscientiously I don't know you guys could say that word I don't like that word uh, <laughs> it's a conscious obje objector standard but they literally obje uh, prohibited any administrative regulation administrative order or executive order from requiring during a, a pan an epidemic the immunization of persons who submit either a written or sworn statement objecting to it based on consciously held beliefs or the written opinion of the person's physician that such immunization would be injurious to the person's health, injurious to the person's health. So this is where we are. Uh, I didn't raise this last week or two weeks ago because um, I've always been of the opinion that the federal government should control when it issues a federal law for all 50 states. I feel that way with the marijuana laws. I feel that way with uh, certain federal laws. It's not a, that's not a political statement. It's just literally that, you know, we need some uniformity in our systems uh, when we have a, a federal government in states. I believe in states rights as well. So, don't put comments in there about what I'm saying. This one was nebulous enough. It was not specific to the federal government. It talks about administrative orders. It didn't say anything about the, the OSHA. However, I believe the Senate Bill 8 will be used as the underpinning for a lawsuit or for a challenge in the state of Kentucky as part of the fact that OSHA can't lord over the state of kentucky with this type of directive because we allow people to be exempt from um, vaccines if they provide certain information so that's the kentucky law update
some questions that I've had recently that I want to put in. This won't take long. Then we'll get to the questions and answers. I think I'm on the last one. Let me see. Yep. All right. So there were some questions that were asked about this last week, and still some of the some of the employers are still wanting to implement testing procedures. So these are some of the questions that are coming out. So does a medical plan have to cover all testing for unvaccinated? I covered this two weeks ago, but the answer is no. CARES Act requires medical plans to pay for testing only when a medical professional has made an individualized determination that testing is medically appropriate. This is not individualized. If you pass a policy that says people who are unvaccinated must be tested once a week, must be tested twice a week, three times a week, whatever you want, Remember, EEOC and CDC has said that that is not a medical test that you have to pay for, that that is something that you can pass that cost on to the individual employee. Caveat, remember your state laws, I've given Indiana as an example, you can't dip somebody below minimum wage, so you have to be careful of that if you're requiring them to do it as they're coming into work and it's a minimum, minimum wage employee if you are forcing them to get tested and they drop below minimum wage, you could get sued for wage and hour violations. Just keep that in mind. If a plan does not currently cover employment-based testing, can it be amended to do so? Yes, but why? That's the answer. And literally, that's, that's the answer. Why would you amend your, your procedures to require you to pay that? Because that could become an increase to your insurance it can cost your company a tremendous amount more if you start covering for all employees, all of their um, COVID testing when you have a federal law saying pass it on to them. All right, the third one, ETS does not require employers to pay for testing. Are there factors employers may want to consider if they want unvaccinated employees to pay for their own testing? This is put in here because of the state-based, local-based testing, make darn sure you're not required to pay for it. There could be state laws, union contracts, collective bargaining agreements, local laws, city ordinances, and other issues that make it difficult to pass that cost on to the employees, so make sure you cover that. Next question, what if an employer decides to pay for employment-based testing outside of the medical plan? Here's the fun thing. I want to help my employees. How about I pay for it outside of the medical plan? Can I do that? Uh, sure, yeah, you can do that. It'll, it may well fall under medical care under ERISA. This is, this is where I love the federal government. You're trying to comply. You're trying to adhere to their policies, and you're saying, can I do this? Can I, can I cover this? Sure you can. It may fall under ERISA, which could cause ERISA laws. Also, if you're doing it in the workplace, it could fall under HIPAA. So now their recommendation is do it through a third-party employee assistance program. Well, how much does that cost you? And now you're putting it into place, and the only thing you've been trying to do is to help the federal government get more people vaccinated. So what do they do? They tell you to go do it, and then they tell you, but if you do, remember, you could be violating ERISA and HIPAA, and we recommend you go get EAP, build the whole program, pay for the cost of it, and don't pass it on to your employees because then you could be sued for doing it. It's like... You're darned if you do and darned if you don't. So I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. The last one, if an employer pays for testing, are employees subject to a tax on the cost of the testing? Most likely this test will be considered a medical care and it's tax free, but it hasn't been definitively determined by our great and wonderful IRS since they're hiring 86,000 brand new IRS agents to come after anybody who wrote a check over $500 in your checking account, it could be taxed. Just wait for it. Uh, if you're not aware of that yet, be aware that every check you write over $500 is now being reported to the federal government for them to scrutinize where you got that check from, who you're sending it to, uh, because we now have 86,000 brand new federal tax authorities scrutinizing everybody's tax returns. Yay. All right, so there's your activity code. I'm going to put that on the screen. Then I'm going to answer questions. Um, so do you want me to read through them or somebody want to read them to me? Yeah, so I'm happy to read through them. We don't have a whole lot, surprisingly. 
And I think people are still just absorbing all of the, the changes. Um, so this one's more an opinion. I think several European countries are going on lockdown again due to high COVID cases. How do you think this is going to affect what's going on in the U.S.? Well, the uh, protests in those several European countries are something to keep in mind uh, for a couple of reasons. One, supply chain issues. Um, all of these, it's not just there, um, it's all across the world with people protesting the issues related to uh, COVID, COVID testing, COVID mask mandates. How does it impact the United States? You're already seeing it. Um, our system is so different from any other system across the world that you really can't compare us to England, us to France, us to Austria or Germany or anywhere else. Why? Because back to the states' rights issue, we're literally 50 different countries with one mama organization sitting there kind of supposed to be there as a safety net, supposed to be there to protect like for um, armies, uh, invasions, uh, international um, uh, agreements, and so on. So the federal government is supposed to be the fallback. We have 50 states that control. So every single state is now saying, you know what, we're going to go our own way, or we're not. But you're now seeing among the states, and that's why I had that state's page listed. It's why I also included the Kentucky Senate Bill 8, because Senate Bill 8 will be the precursor. I bet one of the very first, uh, and I didn't research it because, uh, quite frankly, I didn't have time. And there's so many, there's like 100 pre-posted uh, bills that the Senate and House want to have considered. I guarantee there's probably six different ones that are along these lines that just got written last week in the state of Kentucky to go after the mandatory mask mandate, mandatory vaccination mandate, because the states will control those things. So stay tuned. Um, the next one I see on there I can cover from Tim. I kind of did. KOSHA. I think you're going to see mandatory directives from the legislature to the Kentucky OSHA um, to kind of curtail OSHA's willingness to abide by and be controlled by OSHA. We're going to go our own way. And honestly, I, I potentially see um, Florida being the uh, structure for any new bills coming in where they're going to look and see what got adopted in Florida and then they're going to try to address uh, um, how do we get that into Kentucky and they're going to use that as their their business model. All right and we had um, some questions about what providers are charging and what companies have been paying so if anybody wants to weigh in that would be hugely helpful on what what you might be paying um, for on-site COVID-19 testing. We did have one response that said um, a couple of providers were charging 45 to 60 per test. Um, so if anybody else can weigh in, that'd be great. So I do have a, a question that was sent to me personally. Uh, I won't identify, but I do want to answer it because it's an incredibly, incredibly critical, important issue. Basically, the question said, so what the heck do we do words were different than this, but what the heck do we do if we're in these states where some of them are going to say we're following OSHA? We have, a, we have business locations in multiple states, and we have some that are saying we're going to follow OSHA, some that are going further than OSHA. Let's take New York, California. If you look up California's OSHA laws, they're far more stringent than the federal. But the question is, what do we do if we're in, in the example is Tennessee, Kentucky, Florida, California, Illinois, and New York? What do we do? And the answer is, you really are going to need to have some very carefully structured legal guidance, uh, OSHA compliant guidance, and then the other concern for everyone let me just use Florida. Florida, uh, Walt Disney World is the prime example. They came out with a, a mask mandate before, I'm sorry, 
vaccine mandate before the federal government did. All of a sudden, they pulled it out and they said, time out, we're going to stop everything we're doing. Why? Because they have to comply with state and federal. Federal's going to punish them. Obviously, they stopped it for a little bit, but federal's trying to punish them per employee for not doing it. And Florida says, you dare do it, and we're going to punish you for doing it. So how do you comply with state and federal where one says you shall and one says you shall not? Um, you're going to need to have some very carefully guided legal instruction. And on some of these, you simply cannot comply with both. And so you're going to have to pick and choose which one. In the different states, highly recommended that you first look at each one of the state OSHA requirements. Then you're going to have to really carefully read the law to determine whether the law supersedes or attempts to supersede federal law like Florida's does, or whether like Tennessee, it said, well, you just have to have a waiver in place where the employee can write you a, a written waiver and there's a don't ask, don't tell where you're not allowed to ask your employee why they didn't do it. You can't go into uh, into depth with their religious. If you've been listening to me, I've told you to be careful about asking religious related questions anyway. That's really a slippery slope because you could, you could accidentally discriminate simply by saying, well, show me why you think that your religion bars this. You could have some problems there. So, Let's see. Oh, the on-site testing. I know you can still get it free, not on-site. You can also go to your local pharmacies. But if you remember last week, now we're not under an ETS, so keep that in mind. But last week, uh, we or two weeks ago, we talked about the fact that um, in order to prove that the person tested negative, you shouldn't rely upon that person. This is our federal government's recommendation right now, not a mi mandate shouldn't rely upon that person to test themselves. Someone should see that besides the person themselves because they might lie to you. So let's see. Uh, would I recommend continuing developing policies? That's where I meant to tell you the next step. All right. Um, my recommendation to anybody on here that is an HR professional is you should be building your policies with the understanding that the federal government could re-implement these at any moment. Not only that, but here is the scary part of what the federal government can do with an ETS. Because this is an emergency temporary standard, they literally could set aside the current emergency temporary standard that's sitting in front of the Sixth Circuit right now, ready to be ruled on. They could declare, and I hope they don't do this because it, it's, it's not appropriate, but they could. They could declare, you know what, we're going to throw out the ETS. Throw it out. Here's a new one. Go comply with this one. And it's all over again. Now the Sixth Circuit does not have jurisdiction because the ETS that was the subject of that lawsuit now has been thrown out. They could start over with a brand new one and mandate immediate compliance. My recommendation is try to put together a policy in the event that this will come out of this. I would not go to the level of enforcement yet. If you're not on that, I would stay away from mandatory vaccinations because we talked about Senate Bill 8, KRS 214-036. There are some protections built in already. I would not go to a full-blown mandate because I see some problems and some lawsuits. And as I just got through telling an employer last week, you don't want to be the first. Let somebody else be the first because you just don't know what a judge is going to do. I'm going to stop the share 